waiting for everybody to come in. I'm gonna be reading Treasure Island. Continuing. Just making sure everybody's in here. Everybody gets invited. How's everybody doing? going through and inviting people who I know normally like to be here for the reading now that I know how to share lives Making sure I'm inviting everybody. We're going to be reading Treasure Island. Oh, there's somebody. I'll just send it to those people so far. <coughs> oh, dang, there's a lot of people already. Why, Harris, there you are. Um, weekend has been good. Um, so one of my friends was in town hanging out with me. With somebody who I, like, did the acting thing with. Welcome, everybody. I was like, oh, I still got goggles. I was so busy, like, on the invite screen, and I didn't see anybody. I didn't realize everybody was in here already. Dang. Welcome, welcome. Hello. See, I need to get my glasses on. Where's my glasses? Hold on. There we go. Okay. Hello, TX. Hello, Bay. Um, we are gonna be reading Treasure Island. <laughs> I see we're on the dad jokes. <laughs> Dang, I'm trying to sleep. Oh, how was your Sunday though? Oh, no problem, no problem. Um, it was good, it was good. Just kind of took a, um, a relaxing day. Um, so, we are reading Treasure Island. So, alright, well, welcome everybody. Um, how are you, Whitehurst? How's, how is your weekend going? <laughs> um... And then I have my bookmark, too. One of my friends, uh, fellow streamer, um, suggested I get a bookmark that I, like, I write everybody's name in who uh, sends any gifts. So that way, like, they're recognized and a part of, you know, the official book club. <laughs> so if you want your name written on one of the books on my bookshelf, on my bookmark that I put in my book, that I put on my bookshelf, you can send me a gift and I'll add your name. <laughs> I want a bedtime story. Well, I'm about to. I'm about to. Hey, lover. <laughs> hello, hello. Busy weekend, but I'm glad to be able to relax now. Yes, oh my gosh, I'm so glad. I'm so excited. I'm so glad. Alright, so since you're here, I guess we can get started. <laughs> um. <laughs> Alright, and so yeah, we're going to continue reading... Um. We're on chapter 20, so um, this is what we've read so far, and this is what we have wrapped, rest, left to read, but um, yeah, so let's get started, let's get started. It's getting, it's getting good, it's getting good. Okay. <clears throat> chapter 20. Silver's Embassy. Alright. Sure enough, 
there were two men just, oh wait, sorry, I forgot. I was going to start doing like where I read like the last paragraph of the previous chapter just to, so we can get our bearings of the next chapter. All right, so I'll do that. Um, I don't do it on YouTube video. Um, I haven't thought of doing that. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I guess I could do that. I like, I think I'm just so not on top of like knowing how best to like market myself, but I, I should do that. I should look into doing that too. All right. So the last paragraph of the last chapter, so we can get our bearings for this next chapter. <sighs> I was dead tired, as you may fancy, and when I got to sleep, which was not till after a great deal of tossing, I slept like a log of wood. The rest had long been up, and had already breakfasted and increased the pile of firewood by about half as much again, when I was awakened by the sound of voices. Flag of truce, I heard someone say, and then, immediately after that, with a cry of surprise, Silver himself. And, at that, up I jumped and rubbing my eyes, ran to the loophole in the wall. We are reading Treasure Island. We're in chapter 20. So I'm, I'm just starting chapter 20. I was reading the last part of the previous chapter. So now we're on chapter 20. Sure enough, there were two men just outside the stockade, one of them waving a white cloth, the other, no less a person that, sil that Silver himself, standing placidly by. It was still quite early, and the coldest morning that I think I ever was abroad in, a chill that appears into the morrow. The sky was bright and cloudless overhead, and the tops of the trees shone rosily in the sun, but where Silver stood with his lieutenant all was still in shadow, and they waited knee-deep in a low white vapor that had crawled during the night out of the morass. The chill and the vapor taken together told a poor tale of the island. It was plainly a damp, feverish, unhealthy spot. Keep indoors, men, said the captain. Ten to one, this is a trick. Then he hailed the buccaneer. Who goes? Stand or we fire. Flag of truce, cried Silver. Reading the ten stories. <laughs> Hi, Reno. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> We're reading Treasure Island. Hey, I love the hair. Oh man, th thanks, Dad. <laughs> um. Oh, never mind. Never mind. Read the rest of it. You're being blocked. <laughs> oh man. Okay. Okay. Let's keep it classy, people. Let's keep it classy. Awesome. Thank. Glad you guys like it. I thought it was a call. I was tricked. <laughs> oh man. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay, sorry, I got distracted. <laughs> All right. The captain was in the porch, keeping himself carefully out of the way of a treacherous shot, should say any be intended. But turned, but he turned and spoke to us. Doctors, watch on the lookout. Dr. Livesey, take the north side, if you please. Jim, the east. Gray, west. Ah, thank you. The watch below, all hands to load muskets. Lively, men, and careful. And then he turned again to the mutineers. And what do you want with your flag of truce? He cried. This time it was the other man who replied. Captain Silver, sir, to come on board and make terms, he shouted. Captain Silver, don't know him. Who's he? cried the captain. And he could hear him adding to himself. Captain, is it? My heart and here's promotion. Long John answered for himself, Me, sir, these poor lads have chosen me, Captain, after your desertion, sir, laying a particular emphasis upon the word desertion. We're willing to submit, if we can come to terms, and no bones about it. All I ask is your word, Captain Smollett, to let me safe and sound out of this here stockade, and one minute to get out shot before a gun is fired. My man, said Captain Smollett, I have not the slightest desire to talk to you. If you wish to talk to me, you can come, that's all. If there's any treachery, it'll be on your side, and the Lord help you. That's enough, Captain, shouted Long John cheerily. A word from you's enough. I know a gentleman, and you may lay to that. 
we could see the man who carried the flag of truce attempting to hold Silver back. Nor was that wonderful, seeing how cavalier had been the captain's answer. The Silver laughed at him aloud and slapped him on the back, as if the idea of alarm had been absurd. Then he advanced to the stockade, threw over his crutch, got a leg up, and with great vigor, vigor and skill succeeded in surmounting the fence and dropping safely to the other side. I will confess that I was far too much taken up with what was going on to be the slightest use at sentry. Indeed, I had already deserted my eastern loophole and crept up behind the captain, who had now seated himself on the threshold, with his elbows on his knees, his head in his hands, and his eyes fixed on the water as it bubbled out of the iron kettle in the sand. It, he was whistling, Come, lassies and lads. <laughs> I don't know who you are, but you're already doting me. Aw, thank you. Thank you, Tony. I appreciate that. <laughs> we are reading Treasure Island, for anybody who doesn't know. We're in chapter 20, but it's still good, even if you're late. Late to the party is fine. You're still welcome. Silver had terrible hard work getting up the knoll, what with the steepness of the incline, the thick trees stump, oh, sorry, the thick tree stumps, and the soft sand. He and his crutch were as helpless as a ship in stays, but he stuck to it like a man in silence, and at last arrived before the captain, whom he saluted in the handsomest style. Spoil alert, they all die. <laughs> this isn't Hamlet. <laughs> Or is it? <laughs> um, ah! King's Green! So, thank you, thank you, thank you. You get a spot on my bookmark. On a book. For sending me cookies and flowers. King's Green. Let's see, I don't think you're on here yet, right? Yeah. Okay. <gasps> Whitehurst! Rock and roll! Aw, thank you, Jamal. Thank you. Alright, so let's see. King's Green. Oh! What year is it? King's Green 95. So you're on this book right here. I bet him right now. <gasps> thank you for the cloud, Brad. Oh my gosh, thank you. What year is it? How how are you? A lot of children's worth have spouses. Yeah, that's true. Oh my goodness. Oh, thank you for the heart. I think what year is it? I think you already were on here, but I'll make sure. Maybe not. I don't see you on here, so I'm going to add you. So you're going on my bookmark too. Oh, Mohammed! You're going on my bookmark too. Okay, hold on. Let me... What year is it? You're right here. You're on this book right there. And then we got Muhammad. Okay, so you're going to go on. You did. You did. Welcome, welcome. Okay, so. Oh, oh my gosh, Muhammad. Thank you. That is so beautiful. Okay, okay. Muhammad. Muhammad Al. Oop, I'm missing. I'm. I'm. I need to write. See where I'm writing. Muhammad Al. You're contagious. I can't get rid of these. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, oh, be uh, Top Sail Beach, North Carolina. Welcome, welcome. Okay, and um, Thar. Sorry, I kind of started writing it and looking to spell it, but that's your name on the book right there. On my bookmark. Thank you, thank you. Aw, thank you. We are reading Treasure Island. I just had some people gifting me, so whenever somebody gifts me, I put them on my books, on my bookmark that I put in my book, on my bookshelf. So, I always want to make sure I get those people. Thank you for the follows, guys. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that so much. All right. Sorry, I had to do a quick 
break to add people gifting back to our story once I put the pin cap back on awesome thank you awesome okay <clears throat> where did we go oh thank you thank you oh thank you for the follow too I appreciate that so much all right let's continue with treasure island Will you be my... <laughs> I don't... I'm not rich, so I can't really be a sugar mama. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> oh, hello. Hello, best auntie. Welcome, welcome. We are reading Treasure Island. Thank you for the follows, guys. All right, let's get back, and I'll check in with you guys once um, I take another break of paragraphs. <laughs> okay. Silver had... Oh, what's what? What's, oh, <laughs> we are in chapter 20, but even if, like, you weren't here for the previous chapters, it's still enjoyable, I feel like, you know? Um, <laughs> Treasure Island. Treasure Island. Okay. Ready? You're welcome. You're welcome. All right. Oh, good. good. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'm, okay, I'll continue reading. <laughs> Uh, you guys, good morning. Uh, good morning. Good morning. All right. All right. Uh, okay. But he stuck to it like a man in silence and at last arrived before the captain, whom he saluted in the handsomest style. He was tricked out in his best, an immense blue coat, thick with, thick with brass buttons, hung as low as to his knees, and a fine laced hat was set on the back of his head. Here you are, my man, said the captain, raising his head. You had better sit down. You ain't a goin' to let me inside, captain, complained Long John. It's a main cold morning, to be sure, sir, to sit outside upon the sand. Why, Silver, said the captain, if you had pleased to be an honest man, you might have been sitting in your galley. It's your own doing. You're either my ship's cook, and then you were treated handsome, or Captain Silver, a common mutineer and pirate, and then you can go hang. Well, well, Captain, returned the sea cook, sitting down as he was bidden on the sand. You'll have to give me a hand up again, that's all. A sweet, pretty place you have of it here. Uh, there's Jim. The top of the morning to you, Jim. Doctor, here's my service. Why, there you all are together like a happy family in a manner of speaking. If you have anything to say, my man, better say it, said the captain. Right you were, Captain Smollett, replied Silver. Duty is duty, to be sure. Well, now you look here. That was a good lay of yours last night. I don't deny it was a good lay. Some of you pretty handy with the hand spike end. And I'll not, not deny neither, but what some of my people was shook. Maybe all was shook. Maybe I was shook myself. Maybe that's why I'm here for terms. But you mark me, Captain. It won't be due twice. By thunder, we'll have to do sentry go. And ease off a point or so on the rum. Maybe you think we were all a sheet in the wind's eye. But I'll tell you I was sober. I was only dog-tired, and if I'd awoke a second sooner, I'd caught you out the act, I would. He wasn't dead when I got round to him, not he. Well, says Captain Smollett, as cool as can be. All that Silver said was revertal to him, but you would never have guessed it from his tone. As for me, I began to have an inkling. Ben Gunn's last words came back to my mind. I began to suppose that he had paid the buccaneers a visit while they had lay drunk together round their fire, and I reckoned up with glee that we had only fourteen enemies to deal with. Well, here it is, said Silver. We want that treasure, and we'll have it. That's our point. You would just as soon save our li save your lives, I reckon, and that's yours. You have a chart, haven't you? And this is the picture. <laughs> Hi, what year is it? I'm following to stay with Ezra. Oh, special. Oh, you're funny. Thank you for the follow, guys. Hi, from Orlando. Hello, welcome, welcome. Thank you for the follow. Thank you for the follow, Sky. You're welcome, welcome. We're reading Treasure Island. Ah, thank you, Sky. Ah, oh, thank you, Happy. I'm so glad. <laughs> he 
you made me start reading it. Aw, that is so awesome. I'm so glad to hear that. All right, all right. You're making me smile now. <gasps> yes, Whitehurst. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Hello, Richard. Hello, we are reading Treasure Island. Thank you for the follow. All right, we're in chapter 20. Um almost 21 but even if you're not even if you're getting here late um and you weren't here for the previous chapters it's okay it's still a good good story that's as may be replied the captain oh well you have i know that returned long john you needn't be so husky with a man there ain't a particle of service in that and you may lay to it what i mean is we want your chart now i never meant you no harm myself that won't do with me, my man, interrupted the captain. We know exactly what she meant to do, and we don't care. For now, you see, you can't do it. And the captain looked at him calmly and proceeded to fill a pipe. If Abe, if Abe Gray, Silver broke out, avast there, cried Mr. Smollett. Gray told me nothing, and I asked him nothing. What's more, I would see you and him and this whole island blown clean out of the water into blazes first. So there's my mind for you, my man, on that. This little whiff of temper seemed to cool Silver down. He had been growing nettled before, but now he pulled himself together. Like enough, said he, I would set no limits to what gentlemen might consider ship shape, or might not, as the case were. And seeing as how you are about to take a pipe, Captain, I'll make so free as do likewise. And he filled a pipe and lighted it, and the two men sat silently smoking for quite a while, now looking each other in the face, now stopping their tobacco, now leaning forward to spit. It was as good as the play to see them. Now, resumed Silver, here it is. You give us the chart to get the treasure by, and drop shooting poor seamen, and stoving off their heads in while asleep. You do that, and we'll offer you a choice. Either you come aboard along of us, once the treasure's shipped, and then I'll give you my Affy Davy, upon my word of honor, to clap you somewhere safe ashore, or if you ain't if that ain't to your fancy, some of my hands being rough and having old scores on account of hazing, then you can stay here, you can. We'll divide stores with you, man for man, and I'll give my Affy Davy, as before, to speak the to speak the first ship by sight, and send him here to pick you up. Now you'll own that's talking. Handsomer you couldn't look to get, not you, and I hope, raising his voice, that all hands in this here blockhouse will overhaul my words, for what is spoke to one is spoke to all. Captain Smollett rose from his seat and knocked the ashes of his pipe in the palm of his left hand. Is that all? he asked. Every last word by thunder, asked John. Refuse that and you've seen the last of me, but musket balls. Very good, said the captain. Now you'll hear me. If you'll come up one by one, unarmed, all engaged to clap you all in irons and take you home to a fair trial in England. If you won't, my name is Anne Alexander Smollett. I've flown my sovereign's colors, and I'll see you all to Davy Jones. You can't find the treasure. You can't sail the ship. There's not a man among you fit to sail the ship. You can't fight us, Gray. There got away from five of you. Your ship's in irons, Master Silver. You're on a lee shore, and so you'll find. I stand here and tell you so. And there, the last good words you'll get from me, for in the name of heaven, I'll put a bullet in your back when next I meet you. Tramp, my lad, bundle out of this place, please, hand over hand, and double quick. Silver's face was a picture. His eyes started in his head with a wrath. He shook the fire out of his pipe. Ooh, it's getting, getting, getting good. Give me a hand up, he cried. Not I, returned the captain. Who will give me a hand up, he roared. Not a man among us moved, growling the foulest imprecations. He crawled along the sand till he got hold of the porch and could hoist himself again upon his crutch. Then he spat into the spring. There, he cried, that's what I think of ye. Before an hour's out, I'll stove in your old blockhouse like a rum puncheon. Laugh by thunder, laugh. Before an hour's out, you'll laugh upon the other side. Them that die'll be the lucky ones. And with a dreadful oath, he stumbled off plowed down the sand, was helped across the stockade. After four or five failures by the man with the flag of truce, 
and disappeared in an instant afterward among the trees. I am. I am, Croc. I'm reading Treasure Island. <laughs> it's true. Thought you weren't on till Monday. Yes, RJ, or um, NJ. Um, I was going to do Monday, but I couldn't sleep. And um, so I decided to read some tonight. So I'm glad that you made it. Oh, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Hello, hello. Yeah, so I was trying to like invite everybody, but it only let me like invite a maximum amount of people. So I was trying to invite everybody who I knew was wanting to keep up with these. So um, I'm glad you made it, NJ. Oh, thank you for the follows, guys. Thank you for the follows. Okay, we just finished chapter 20. So I only, I only read one chapter so far. So, um... Yes, yes, I'm gonna read one or two more chapters. Because they're fairly short chapters, so... That was only one. So... Chapter 21, The Attic. As soon as Silver disappeared... The captain, who had been closely watching him, turned toward the interior of the house and found not a man of us at his post but Gray. It was the first time we had ever seen him angry. Quarters, he roared. And then, as we all slunk back to our places, Gray, he said, I'll put your name in the log. You stood by your duty like a seaman. Mr. Trelawney, I'm surprised at you, sir. Doctor, I thought you had worn the king's coat. If that was how you served at Fontenay, Fontenoy, sir, you'd have been better in your berth. The doctor's watch were all back in their, at their loopholes. The rest were busy loading the spare muskets, and every one with the red face. You may be certain, and a flea in his ear, as the saying is. The captain looked on for a while, and let us suffer in silence. Then he spoke. My lads, said he, I've given silver a broadside. I pitched it in red hot on purpose, and before the hour's out, as he said, we shall be boarded. We're outnumbered. I needn't tell you that. But we fight in shelter, and a minute ago, I should have said we fought with discipline. I have no manner of doubt that we can drub them, if you choose. Then he went the rounds and saw, as he said, that all was clear. Have you... <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe. Um, I need to tell you that. But okay. Then we went the round the hall was clear. Okay. On the two short sides of the house, east and west, there were only two loopholes. On the south side, where the porch was, two again, and on the north side, five. There was a round score of muskets for the seven of us. The firewood had been built into four piles, tables, you might say, one about the middle of each side. And on each of these tables, some ammunition and four loaded muskets were laid ready to the hand of the defenders. In the middle, the cutlasses lay ranged. Toss out the fire, said the captain. The chill is past and we mustn't have smoke in our eyes. The iron fire basket was carried bodily out by Mr. Trelawney, and the embers smoldered among sand. Hawkins hasn't had it his breakfast. Hawkins, help yourself and back to your post to eat it, continued Captain Smollett. Lively, now, my lad. You'll want it before you've done. Hunter, serve out a round of brandy to all hands. And while this was going on, the captain completed, in his own mind, the plan of the defense. Doctor, you will take the door, he resumed. See and don't expose yourself. Keep within and fire through the porch. Hunter, take the east side there. Joyce, you stand by the west, my man. Mr. Trelawney, you are the best shot. You and Gray will take this long north side with the five loopholes. It's there the danger is. If they can get up to it and fire in upon us through our own ports, things would begin to look very dirty indeed. Hawkins, neither you nor I are much account at shooting. We'll stand by to load and bear a hand. As the captain had said, the chill was past. As soon as the sun had climbed above our girdle of trees, it fell with all its force upon the clearing and drank up the vapors at a drought. Soon the sand was baking and the resin melting in the logs of the blockhouse. Jackets and coats were flung aside, shirts thrown open at their neck and rolled up to the shoulders and we stood there, each at his post in a fever of heat and anxiety. An hour passed away. Hang them, said the captain. 
This is as dull as the doldrums. Gray, whistle for a wind. And just at that moment came the first news of the attack. If you please, sir, said Joyce. If I see anyone, am I to fire? I told you so, cried the captain. Thank you, sir, returned Joyce, with the same quiet civil civility. Nothing followed for a time, but the remark had set us all on the alert, straining ears and eyes. The musketeers with their pieces balanced in their hands, the captain out in the middle of the blockhouse, with his mouth very tight and a frown on his face. So some seconds passed, till suddenly Joyce whipped up his musket and fired. The report had scarcely died away ere it was repeated and repeated from within, with, without in a scattering volley, shot behind shot, like a string of geese. From every side of the enclosure, several bullets struck the log house, but not one entered, not, but not one entered. And as the smoke cleared away and vanished, the stockade and the woods around it looked as quiet and empty as it had before. Not a bow waved, not the gleam of a musket barrel betrayed the presence of our foes. Did you hit your man? asked the captain. No, sir, replied Joyce. I believe not, sir. Next best thing to tell the truth, muttered Captain Smollett. Load his gun, Hawkins. How many should you say there were on your side, doctor? I know precisely, said Dr. Livesey. Three shots were fired on this side. I saw the three flashes. Two close together, one farther to the west. Three, repeated the captain. And how many on yours, Trelawney? But this was not so easily answered. There had come many from the north, seven by the squire's computation, eight or nine, according to Gray. From the east and west, only a single shot had been fired. It was plain, therefore, that the attack would be developed from the north, and that on the other three sides were, we were only to be annoyed by a show of hostilities. But Captain Smollett made no change in his arrangements. If the mutineers succeeded in crossing the stockade, he argued, they would take possession of any unprotected loophole and shoot us down like rats in our own stronghold. Nor had we much time left to us for thought. Suddenly, with a loud huzza, a little cloud of pirates leaped from the woods on the north side and ran straight on the stockade. At the same moment, the fire was once more opened from the woods, and a rifle ball sang through the doorway and knocked the doctor's musket into bits. Uh oh, we are reading Treasure Island. So welcome everybody. It's a Disney Princess Library. <laughs> thank you, thank you. All right, nobody is perfect, but why not? Ah, <laughs> oh, Nave, so you're funny. You, you guys are so sweet. Thank you. All right, let's continue reading Treasure Island. The border swarmed over the fence like monkeys. Squire and Gray fired again and yet again. Three men fell, one forward into the enclosure, two back on the outside. But of these, one was evidently more frightened than hurt, for he was on his feet again in a crack and instantly disappeared among the trees. Two had bit the dust, one had fled, four had made good their footing inside our defenses, while from the shelter of the woods, seven or eight men, each evidently supplied with several muskets, kept up a hot, t hot though useless fire on the log house. The four who had boarded made straight before them for the building, shouting as they ran, and the men among the trees shouted back to encourage them. Several shots were fired, but such was the hurry of the marksmen that not one appeared to have taken effect. In a moment, the four pirates had swarmed up the mound and were upon us. The head of Job Anderson, the boatswain, appeared at the middle loophole. Adam, all hands, all hands, he roared in a voice of thunder. At the same moment, another pirate grasped Hunter's musket by the muzzle, wrenched it from his hands, plucked it through the loophole, and with one stunning blow laid the poor fellow senseless on the floor. Meanwhile, a third, running unarmed all around the house, appeared suddenly in the doorway and fell with his cutlass on the, do on the doctor. Our position was utterly reversed. A moment since we were firing under cover at an exposed enemy, now it was we who lay uncovered and could not return a blow. The log house was full of smoke to which we owed our comparative safety. Cries and confusion, the flashes and reports of pistol shots, and one loud groan rang in my ears. Out, lads, out, and fight them in the open. Cutlasses, cried the captain. I snatched a cutlass from the pile, and someone, at the same time snatching another, gave me a cut across the knuckles, which I hardly felt. 
I dashed out of the door into the clear sunlight. Someone was following close behind. I knew not whom. Right in front, the doctor was pursuing his assailant down the hill, and just as my eyes fell upon him, beat down his guard, and sent him sprawling on his back with a great slash across the face. Round the house, lads, round the house, round the house, cried the captain. And even in the early hurly-burly, I perceived a change in his voice. Mechanically, I obeyed, turned eastward, and with my cutlass raised, ran around the corner of the house. Next moment, I was face to face with Anderson. He roared aloud, and his hang hanger went up above his head, flashing in the sunlight. I had not time to be afraid, but as the blow still hung impending, leaped into a trice upon one side, and missing my foot in the soft sand, rolled headlong down the slope. When I had first sallied from the door, the other mutineers had been already swarming up the palisade to make an end of us. One man in a red nightcap, with his cutlass in his mouth, had even got upon the top and thrown a leg across. Well, so short had been the interval that when I found my feet again, all were in the same posture. The fellow with the red nightcap still halfway over, another still just showing his head above the top of the stockade, others coming up from behind. And yet, in this breath of time, the fight was over and the victory was ours. Welcome, welcome. Aw, I love the follows. Smart. Aw, thank you. Oh my gosh, Scott, thank you so much. That's really sweet of you. No. <laughs> thank you for the follows, guys, and all the likes and the gifts. I appreciate it. We're reading Treasure Island. Aw, what year is it? Thank you. I'm so glad that you're here, too. Alright. Gray following close behind me, had cut down the big boatswain ere he had time to recover from his lost blow. Another had been shot at a loophole in the very act of firing into the house, and now lay in agony. The pistol still smoking in his hand. A third, as I had seen, the doctor had disposed of at a blow. Of the four who had scaled the palisade, one only remained unaccounted for, and he, having left his cutlass on the field, was now clambering out again with the fear of death upon him. Fire! Fire from the house! cried the doctor. And you, lads, back into cover. But his words were unheeded. No shot was fired. And the last boarder made good his escape and disappeared with the rest into the wood. In three seconds, nothing remained of the attacking party but the five who had fallen, four on the inside and one on the outside of the palisade. The doctor and Gray and I ran full speed for shelter. The survivors would soon be back where they had left their muskets, and we well knew that at any moment the fire might recommence. The house was by this time somewhat cleared of smoke, and we saw at a glance the price we had paid for victory. Hunter lay beside his loophole stunned, Joyce by his shot through the head. Never to move again, while right in the center the squire was supporting the captain, one as pale as the other. The captain's wounded, said Mr. Trelawney. Have they run? asked Mr. Smollett. <gasps> Jinnowin! Thank you! Oh, let me finish this real quick. All that could, you may be bound, returned the doctor. But there's five of them, we'll never run again. Five, cried the captain. Come, that's better. Five against three leaves us four to nine. That's better odds than we had at starting. We were seven to nineteen then, or thought we were, and that's as bad to bear. The mutineers were soon only eight in number, for the man shot by Mr. Trelawney on board the schooner died that same evening of his wound. But this was, of course, not known till after by the faithful party. Oh my gosh. Um, okay, so, Jinnowin, I don't think I've added you, or did I? Let me see if you're on one of my books. You are not. I don't see you. So anytime anybody sends a gift, I add your name to my books on my bookshelf, on my bookmark that I put in my book. So thank you so much, Janowin. I'll put you right there. Jin. So you're on this book right there. <laughs> uh, thank you so thank you so much for the gift. I appreciate it a lot. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the ice cream. I love it. If you do go on YouTube, then your fans can want, fans can want 
watch you anytime oh that's a good idea oh my gosh that makes sense Shrek thank you for enlightening me on that like I didn't even think about that that is so smart I should do that um I need to figure out how oh <gasps> first I love it I love it. especially with the story you know like to keep up like into like you know that's a great idea thank you for that idea um I'll definitely Oh, because I can save the lives. I didn't think of that. I can save the lives after, um, like, I'm here. And then I can upload them to YouTube. You're so smart. You're so smart. See, I need to, get, like, I'm not, I'm still, like, starting to slowly get um, on track with, like, social media and, like, really um, using it to my advantage. So thank you for the idea. That's really smart. Um, I wonder, I hope that, I don't know how long that TikTok lets me keep the old videos old lives that I do because then that way um I don't know how but let's go oh my gosh white hairs thank you so much yeah I guess I'll just um go back in the history and hopefully like from the beginning of reading this book um yeah they automatically save um and then you can download them because it's like a it's kind of confusing I didn't understand like what the point of it was but that makes like that's a perfectly point um uh that's like a really good like my point to have them hello hello can you tell us what i do you do for um i do modeling and acting full time and then i also do um uh twitch streaming um as well as this so that's like what my i mainly do i do have um a few other things like on the side that like makes some like uh passive income like i do podcasts for um like chronic illness based podcasts and stuff like that but oh thank you Oh my gosh, that's so nice, uh, Eason. My Twitch is the same name as my name here, Bad Pika P. So if you want to go follow me, um, I stream usually Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evenings, uh, Central Time. Um, elementary teacher. <laughs> um, and Twitch, I'm streaming, I play a variety of games. Most of the games I play are on my Nintendo Switch, um, Oh, uh, I am, I am feeling better. I mean, I'm still tired a lot, so, like, I still have, like, a little energy, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm managing it. I have, a, a an appointment with my doctor who manages my iron levels next week, so hopefully, if my levels are still low enough, I can get an iron, another iron infusion and be good. Uh, good morning, good morning. Yes, um, that was the end of that chapter, and the next, uh, section, we're now in part five. Um, my sea adventure part five. So, um, I will go ahead and continue in chapter 22, my sea adventure. So, but thank you all for being here. And I am so, I like it so awesome when you, I see so many people enjoying this. This is the picture of the beginning of the chapter. So let us continue. All right. There was no return of the mutineers, not so much as another shot out of the woods. They had got their rations for that day. Get it? That was in, that was in quotes. <laughs> As the captain put it, and we had the place to ourselves and a quiet time to overhaul the wounded and get dinner. Squire and I cooked outside in spite of the danger. Out of the eight men who had fallen in the action, only three still breathed. That one of the pirates who had been shot at the loophole, Hunter and Captain Smollett, and of these, the first two were as good as dead. The mutineer, indeed, died under the doctor's knife, and Hunter, do what we could, never recovered consciousness in this world. He lingered all day, breathing loudly like the old buccaneer at home in his apoplectic fit. I don't know that, how to pronounce that word. <laughs> we're just going to pretend. Apoplectic <laughs> fit, but the bones of his chest had been crushed by the blow, and his skull fractured in falling. In some time in the following night, without sign or sound, he went to his maker. As for the captain, his wounds were grievous indeed, but not dangerous. No organ was fatally injured. Anderson's ball, for it was Job that shot him first, had broken his shoulder blade and touched the lung, not badly. The second had only torn and displaced some muscles in the calf. He was sure to recover, the doctor said, but in the meantime, and for weeks to come, he must not walk nor move his arm, nor so much as speak when he could help it. My own accidental cut across the knuckles was a flea bite. Dr. Livesey patched it up with the plaster. 
After dinner, the squire and the doctor sat by the captain's side a while in consultation, and when they had talked to their heart's content, it being then a little past noon, the doctor took up his hat and pistols, girt on a cutlass, put the chart in his pocket, and with the musket on his shoulder, crossed the palisade on the north and set off briskly through the trees. Gray and I were sitting together at the far end of the blockhouse, to be out of earshot of our officers consulting, and Gray took his pipe out of his mouth and fairly forgot to put it back in, so thunderstruck he was at this occurrence. "'Why, in the name of Davy Jones,' said he, "'is Dr. Livesey mad?' "'Why, no,' says I. "'He's about the last of his of this crew for that, I take it.' "'Well, shipmate,' said Gray, "'mad he may not be, but if he's not, you mark my words, I am.' "'I take it,' replied I. "'The doctor has his idea, and if I am right, he's going now to see Ben Gunn.' I was right, as appeared later, but in the meantime, the house being stifling hot, and a little patch of sand inside the palisade ablaze with midday sun, I began to get another thought into my head, which was not by any means so right. What I began to do was to envy the doctor, walking in the cool shadow of the woods, with the birds about him, and the pleasant smell of the pines, while I sat grilling with my clothes stuck to the hot resin, and so much blood about me, and so many poor dead bodies lying all around, that I took a disgust at the place that was almost as strong as fear. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. <laughs> Thank you, what year? And... All the time I was washing out the blockhouse, and then washing up the things from dinner, this disgust and envy kept growing stronger and stronger, till at last, being near a bread bag and no one then observing me, I took the first step toward my escape, or sorry, escapade, and filled both pockets of my coat with biscuit. I was a fool, if you like, and certainly I was going to do a foolish, overbold act, but I was determined to do it with all the precautions in my power. These biscuits, should anything befall me, would keep me, at least, from starving till far on in the next day. The next thing I laid hold of was a brace of pistols, and I al and as I already had a powder horn and bullets, I felt myself well supplied with arms. As for the scheme I had in my head, it was not a bad one in itself. I was to go down the sandy spit that divides the anchorage on the east from the open sea, find the white rock I had observed last evening, and ascertain whether it was there or not that Ben Gunn had hidden his boat. A thing quite worth doing, as I still believe. But as I was certain I should not be allowed to leave the enclosure, my only plan was to take French leave and slip out when nobody was watching, and that was so bad a way of doing it as made the thing itself wrong. But I was only a boy, and I had made my mind up. Well, as things at last fell out, I found an admirable opportunity— the squire and Gray were busy helping the captain with his bandages. The coast was clear. I made a bolt for it over the stockade and into the thickest of the trees, and, the, and before my absence was observed, I was out of cry of my companions. This was my second folly, far worse than the first, as I left but two sound men to guard the house. But like the first, it was a help toward saving all of us. I took my way straight for the east coast of the island, for I was determined to go down the sea side of the spit to avoid all chance of observation from the anchorage. I was already late in the afternoon, although still warm and sunny. As I continued to thread the tall woods, I could hear from far before me not only the continuous thunder of the surf, but a certain tossing of foliage and grinding of boughs, which showed me the sea breeze had set, the higher, set in higher than usual. Soon cool draughts of air began to reach me, and a few steps farther I came forth into the open borders of the grove, and saw the sea lying blue and sunny to the horizon, and the surf tr tumbling and tossing its foam along the beach. I have never seen the sea quiet round Treasure Island. The sun might, abl might blaze overhead, the air be without a breath, the surface smooth and blue, but still these great rollers would be running along, all along the external coast thundering and thundering by day and night, and I scarce believe there is one spot in the island where a man would be out of earshot of their noise. 
I walked along beside the surf with great enjoyment till, thinking I was far enough to the south, I took the cover of the sum of some thick bushes and crept warily up to the ridge of the spit. Behind me was the sea, in front the anchorage, the sea breeze, as though it had the sooner blown itself out by its unusual violence, had already at an end. It had been succeeded succeeded by light, variable airs from the south and southeast, carrying great banks of fog, and the anchorage, under lee of Skeleton Island, lay still and let leaden as with first as when first we entered it. The Hispaniola in that unbroken mirror was exactly portrayed from the truck to the waterline, the Jolly Roger hanging from her peak. Alongside lay one of the gigs, silver in the stern sheets, him I could always recognize, while a couple of men were leaning over the stern bulwarks, one of them with a red cap, the very rogue that I had seen some hours before stride legs upon the palisade. Apparently they were talking and laughing, though at that distance, upward of a mile, I could, of course, hear no word of what was said. All at once there began the most horrid, unearthly screaming, which at first startled me badly, though I soon remembered the voice of Captain Flint, and even, th and even though I could make out, and even thought I could make out the bird by her bright plumage as she sat perched upon her master's wrist. Soon after, the jolly boat shoved off and pulled for shore, and the man with the red cap and his comrade went below. Just about the same time the sun had gone down behind the spyglass, and as the fog was collecting rapidly, it began to grow dark in earnest. I saw I must lose no time if I were to find the boat that evening. The white rock, visible enough above the brush, was still some eight of a mile further down the spit, and it took me a good goodish while to get up to up with it, crawling often on all fours among the scrub. Night had almost come when I laid my hand on its rough sides. Right below it there was an exceedingly s small hollow of green turf, hidden by banks in a thick underwood about knee-deep that grew there very plentifully, and in the center of the dell, sure enough, a little tent of goatskins, like what the gypsies carry about with them in England. Good morning, good morning. We are reading Treasure Island. For anybody new here, about to fall asleep? No problem, no problem. Aw, thank you. Love your voice. Um, we are reading Treasure Island. Thank you for the follows. Aw, that's awesome. Creative writing. Um, can... <laughs> oh, man. It's too funny. Good morning. Hello. Hello, Kyle. Hello, Char. <gasps> Whitehurst. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you. I'm doing good. Just reading some Treasure Island. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for all the likes. Thank you for the follows. Thank you for all the kind words. Thank you for the gifts. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. <laughs> all right. I dropped into the hollow, lifted the side of the tent, and there was Ben Gunn's boat. Homemade, if ever anything was homemade. A rude lopsided framework of tough wood and stretched upon that a covering of goat skin with the hair inside. The thing was extremely small, even for me, and I can hardly imagine that it could have floated with a full-sized man. There was one thwart set as low as possible, a kind of stretcher in the bows, and a double paddle for propulsion. I had not then seen a coracle such as the ancient Britons made, but I have seen one since, and I can give you no fairer idea of Ben Gunn's boat than by saying it was like the first and the worst worst coracle ever made by man, but the great advantage of the coracle it possessed, for it was light and portable. I'm in Missouri. Thank you so much. It's so nice to close my eyes. Oh my gosh, what year is it? Thank you. <gasps> Charham! Thank you so much for the rose! Whenever somebody sends me a gift, I write their name on one of the books on my bookmark that I put in my book. So thank you, thank you. So char ham two eight three. I'll put you right here. Char ham eight two three. So there's your name right there on that book. Awesome, thank you so much. 
appreciate that. All right. <clears throat> well, now that I had found the boat, you would have thought I had had enough trontery for once. Oh, sorry, truantry for once. But in the meantime, I had taken another notion and became so obstinately fond of it that I would have carried it out, I believe, in the teeth of Captain Smollett himself. This was to slip out under cover of the night, cut the Hispaniola adrift, and let her go ashore where she fancied. I had quite made up my mind that the mutineers, after the repulse of the morning, had nothing nearer their hearts than to up anchor and away to sea. This, I thought, it would be a fine thing to prevent. And now that I had seen how they left their watchmen up unprovided with a boat, I thought it might be done with little risk. Down I sat to wait for darkness, and made a hearty meal of biscuit. It was a night out of a ten thousand for my purpose. The fog had now buried all heaven, as the last rays of daylight dwindled and disappeared. Absolute blackness settled down on Treasure Island. And when, at last, I shouldered the coracle and groped my way out of the hollow where I had supped, there were but two points visible on the anchorage. One was the great fire on shore, by which the defeated pirates lay carousing in the swamp. The other, a mere blur of light upon the darkness, indicated the position of the anchored ship. She had swung round to the ebb. Her bow was now toward me. The only lights on board were in the cabin and what I saw was merely a reflection of the fog of the strong rays that flowed from the stern window. The ebb had already run some time, and I had to wade through a long belt of swampy sand, where I sank several times above the ankle, before I came to the edge of the retreating water, and, wading a little way in, with some strength and dexterity, set my coracle keel downward on the surface. And that's the end of that chapter. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Treasure Island key. <laughs> We're reading Treasure Island for anybody new here. Um, yeah, so awesome. It's awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you for the follows. Thank you for the likes. Um, let's see. Do we want to do one more chapter? Or do we want to call it a night? It's a short chapter. Might as well read just one more chapter, okay? One more chapter, then we can go to sleep or start in the mornings depending on where we're at <laughs> chapter 23 the ebb tide runs one more okay sounds good the oracle as i had ample reason to know before i was done with her was a very safe boat for a person of my height and weight both buoyant and clever in a seaway but she was the most crossed grained lopsided craft to manage do as you please, she always made more leeway than anything else, and turning round and round was the maneuver she was best at. Even Ben Gunn himself had, has admitted that she was queer to handle till you knew her way. Certainly I did not know her way. She turned in every direction but the one I bound to go. The most part of the time we were broadside on, and I am very sure I never should have made the ship at all but for the tide. By good fortune, paddle as I pleased. The tide was still sweeping me down, and there lay the Hespinola, right in the fairway, hardly to be missed. First she loomed before me like a blot of something yet blacker than darkness. Then her spars and hull began to take shape, and the next moment, as it seemed, for the farther I went, the brisker grew the current of the ebb, I was alongside of her hawser, and had laid hold. The hawser was as taut as a bowstring, so strong she pulled upon her anchor, all around the hole in the blackness. The rippling current bubbled and chattered like a little mountain stream. One cut with my sea gully, and the Hispaniola would go humming down the tide. So far, so good, but it next occurred to my recollection that a taut hawser, suddenly cut, is a thing as dangerous as a kicking horse. Ten to one, if I were so foolhardy as to cut the Hispaniola from her anchor, I and the oracle would be knocked clean out of the water. This brought me to a full stop, and if fortune had not again particularly favored me, I should have had to abandon my design, but the light airs which had begun blowing from the southeast and south had hauled round after nightfall into the southwest. Just while I was meditating, a puff came, caught the Hispaniola, 
and first forced her up into the currents, and to my great joy, I felt the hawser slacken in my grasp, and the hand by which I had held it dipped for a second under water. With that, I made my mind up, took out my gully, opened it with my teeth, and cut one strand after another, till the vessel only swung by two. Then I lay quiet, waiting to sever these last when the strain should be once more lightened by a breath of wind. All this time I had heard the sound of loud voices from the cabin, but, to say truth, my mind had been so entirely taken up with other thoughts that I had scarcely given ear. Now, however, when I had nothing else to do, I began to pay more heed. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why you want to see my outfit. This is a reading. We're reading Treasure Island, and my outfit's nothing special. And, um... Once I recognized the four, recognized for the coxswain's Israel hands, that had been Flint's gunner in former days. The other was, of course, my friend of the red nightcap. Ooh. Thank you, what year? <laughs> the other was, of course, my friend of the nightcap. Both men were plainly the worst of drink, and they were still drinking, for even while I was listening, one of them, with a drunken cry, opened the stern window and threw out something which I de divined to be an empty bottle, but they were not only tipsy, it was plain that they were fiercely angry. Oaths flew like hailstones, and every now and then there came forth such an explosion as I thought was sure to end in blows, but each time the quarrel passed off, and the voices grumbled lower for a while, until the next crisis came, and in its turn passed away without result. On shore, I could see the glow of the great campfire bur burning warmly through the shoreside trees. Someone was singing a dull, old droning sailor song, with a droop and a quaver at the end of every verse, and seemingly no end to it at all but the patience of the singer. I had heard it on the voyage more than once, and remembered these words, But one man of her crew alive, what put to sea with seventy-five? and I thought it was a ditty rather too dolefully appropriate for a company that had met such cruel losses in the morning. But, indeed, from what I saw, all these buccaneers were as callous as the sea they sailed on. At last the breeze came. The schooner sidled and drew nearer in the dark. I felt the hawser slapped once more, and with a good, tough effort, cut the last fibers through. The breeze had but little action on the oracle, and here's the picture. <laughs> Aw, thank you. <laughs> and almost instantly swept against the bows of the Hispaniola. At the same time, the schooner began to turn upon her heel, spinning slowly, end for end, across the current. I wrought like a fiend, for I expected every moment to be swamped, and since I found I could not push the coracle directly off, I now shoved straight astern. At length I was clear of my dangerous neighbor, and just as I gave the last impulsion, my hands came across a light cord that was trailing, o that was trailing over board across the stern bulkward. Instantly I grasped it. Why I should have done so, I can hardly say. It was at first mere instinct, but once I had it in my hands and found it fast, curiosity began to get the upper hand and I determined I should have one look through the cabin window. I pulled in hand over hand on the cord, and when I judged myself near enough, rose, an infinite, rose at infinite risk to about half my height, and thus command, commanded the roof and a slice of the interior of the cabin. By this time the schooner and her little consort were gliding swiftly through the water. Indeed, we had already fetched up level with the campfire. The ship was talking, as sailors say, loudly, treading the innumerable ripples with an incessant weltering splash, and until I got my eye above the window sill, I could not comprehend why the watchman had taken no alarm. One glance, however, was sufficient, and it was only one glance that I durst take from that unsteady skiff. It showed me hands and his companion locked together in deadly wrestle, each with a hand upon the other's throat. I dropped upon the thwart again, none too soon, for I was near overboard. I could see nothing for the moment but these two furious and crimsoned faces swaying together under the smoky lamp, and I shut my eyes to let them grow once more familiar with the darkness. 
The endless ballad had come to an end at last, and the whole diminished company about the campfire had broken into the chorus I had heard so often. Fifteen men on the dead man's chest, yo-ho-ho, and a bottle of rum. Drink and the devil had done for the rest, yo-ho-ho, and a bottle of rum. I was just thinking how busy drink and the devil were at that very moment in the cabin of the Hispaniola, when I was surprised by a sudden lurch of the or coracle. At the same moment, she yawned sharply and seemed to change her course. The speed in the meantime had greatly increased. I opened my, my, my eyes at once. All around me were little ripples, combining over with a sharp, bristling sound and slightly phosphorescent. The Hispaniola herself, a few yards in whose wake I was still being whirled along, seemed to stagger in her course, and I, shot, and I saw her spars toss a little against the blackness of the night. Nay, as I looked longer, I might sure she also was wheeling to the southward. I glanced over my shoulder, and my heart jumped against my ribs. There, right behind me, was the glow of the campfire. The current had turned at right angles, sweeping around along with it the tall schooner and the little dancing coracle, ever quickening, ever bubbling higher, ever muttering louder. It went spinning through the narrows for the open sea. Suddenly, the schooner in front of me gave a violent yaw, turning, perhaps, through twenty degrees, and almost at the same moment, one shout followed another from on board. I could hear feet pounding on the companion ladder, and I knew that the two drunkards had at last been interrupted in their quarrel and awakened to a sense of their disaster. I lay down flat in the bottom of that wretched skiff, and I devoutly recommended my spirit to its maker. At the end of the straits, I made sure we must fall into some bar of raging breakers, where all my troubles would be ended speedily, and though I could perhaps bear to die, I could not bear to look upon my fate as it approached. So I must have lain for hours, continually beaten to and fro upon the billows, now and again wetted with flying sprays, and never ceasing to expect death at the next plunge. Gradually, weariness grew upon me, a numbness and occasional stupor fell upon my mind even in the midst of my terrors, until sleep at last supervened, and in my sea-tossed coracle I lay and dreamed of home and the old Admiral Binbow. Oh no. <laughs> okay, we've been reading, um, <laughs> um, Treasure Island. I don't know who that is. Oh! <gasps> King Zane, thank you for the rose again. Oh my goodness, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Aw, what year is it, right? It is, no matter what age, for sure. <laughs> thank you for the follows, guys. Alright, so that was like four chapters were. We are leaving off at chapter 24, so I think now is a good time to end and put my bookmark with all your names that have gifted on the books that I wrote in my book. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's been amazing. I hope you guys enjoyed it and have a good evening. Of course, Whitehurst. Thank you for hanging out with me. Thank you. <gasps> Thank you. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much. I'm glad that you guys enjoy it, and I'm glad that you guys have been able to um, be here for it, too, and not miss it. Alright, so I hope you all have a wonderful evening, and or a wonderful morning or day, and I will be reading tomorrow night as well. Maybe a little bit earlier than I did tonight, because this was like a really late night on accident, because <laughs> I couldn't sleep. Ah, thank you. Oh my gosh, I love him so much. <laughs> all right, you all have a wonderful evening, and thank you again, and I'll see you guys tomorrow night. All right, see you guys.